Let's go a little bit. Well, nice to be back with you again. And could I get you to turn to the book of Romans? Uh, in the book of Romans, chapter 7. Now, in the last uh, couple of visits, we've been sort of putting together a bit of a series based upon a wee visit to 2 Timothy chapter 4 with the Apostle Paul uh, looking back at his life he made a reference where he said I have fought a good fight but the Christian life is it's a fight struggle and he fought a good one and we start off by saying that it's not a good fight if we're in conflict with our brother and our sister in Christ the enemy is the devil his wiles, his snares, and his accusatory roar, the roar of the lion. So, as a believer, don't be scared of the roar of the lion. Uh, we then, last time around, we moved to uh, think about the devil within. And just to reinforce it, here's this wee verse in Romans chapter 7 and verse 23 where Paul says but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind so he says within me there's there's conflict there's an argument there's controversy uh, when I want to do good Evil's there to try and draw me back from it. Uh, and evil's always finding energy to do what is wrong, but I know it's wrong. So he's simply saying that behind our waistcoat there are devils there that we're going to struggle with. The devil behind our own waistcoat. Last time we thought about doubts, those lying emotions. Where at times we feel that our sins are not really forgiven, that, that we're not really perfect before God, and, and God doesn't want us to live our lives surrounded by constant doubt of our salvation. God wants us to enjoy our salvation. And then bitterness. Naomi, a broken world, and she makes a decision. I'm going to go to somewhere to rebuild my broken world where things are going to get better. And then she discovers her world becomes even more broken. And the brokenness in her life turns her into someone very different from what she was before. Her sweetness is gone and it's replaced with bitterness. The devil is in. So I'm going to take that same way idea and move it a wee bit further along. And as we are in Romans chapter 7, go down to verse 8. Romans chapter 7 and verse 8. Here's what it says. But sin, now that's uh, that sinful nature inside of you. That's uh, the, 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 the trouble inside, the evil inside. But sin finding occasion. So sin inside, always trying to find an opportunity. An open window, an unlocked door to get into your life, to make you sin against God, to, to lead you to your spiritual defeat. Sin is wicked, sin is evil, sin is your enemy. And it's in the ring with you, and it's always trying to find an opportunity to bring you down. So it says, but sin finding occasion by the commandment wrote on me all manner of concupiscence for without the law sin was dead and go down to verse 11 where it says for sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me so what's he sort of getting at here well, at the heart of it is concupiscence. So if I said to you, did you have any trouble this week with concupiscence? You might say, well, I had a few sniffles, I had a sore head, I thought I had COVID, 
but I don't think I had any concupiscence. It's one of those old words that's archaic, it is old fashioned, we don't know what it means, but let me tell you what it means, it's all to do with your desires. You live your day with all sorts of desires. And most of them are simple desires, don't cause you any trouble. You go to the supermarket, you say there's carrots, and there's uh, lettuce, and, and, and uh, eggs, and all that lovely wholesome food. And those are simple desires, heaven desires, good desires. And then you get to the checkout desk, and there's a big bar of chocolate, and it's calling you over, it's enticing you, it becomes an evil desire. That's what it's about. Your desires that become evil desires. And here's how sinful sin is. It will even use something of God, righteous and holy in itself, the commandment of God, and will use it as a stick to beat us with and to defeat us. <clears throat> Let us see you come here in here this morning and, and, and before you got here the men were busy painting the walls and they're still back. And they put up a wee sign simply saying, please, do not touch the walls, it's that paint, leave them alone. If that sign wasn't there, you'd come in, you'd take your seat, you'd ignore the walls. But some of you, you'd come in and you'd see the sign and you'd look at the wall and that becomes a provocation. That becomes a dare you touch the wall. And inside the desire rises up, an evil desire, and you look around and make sure nobody's watching, especially those that put the sign there and pin the walls, and you'll stick your finger in, and you'll touch the wall, and you'll realize it is red paint. <laughs> an evil desire, that's concupiscence. It stirs up, it rots within you, it stirs up inside of you those old passions and emotions, those evil desires that bring you down. It's a wee bit like the Falklands conflict. A, a, a term came out of the conflict in the Falklands called yumping. Uh, every soldier knew what it was and knew what it was. All these big tough soldiers in the Falklands, freezing cold and wet. And they've all this heavy load on their back, the weapons and the ammunition, and they're going to yump all the way to Port Stanley. You say to yourself, why not just land the boat Stanley? Oh no, too dangerous. No, no, they established a base of operation. The other side of the Falklands. That's what final occasion actually means. It's a base of operation. And once they established a base of operation and they defended it, then they moved out against Port Stanley and they conquered the Argentine. This is some looking for a base of operation. It looks at your life and tries to figure out how can I get this believer and defeat him and bring him and get him out of the ring? How can I nullify the Christian experience? And it's always looking for a base of operation and will find it in your desires. They'll start off with simple desires and then become evil desires and then you're slain by your evil desires. Let me show you how it works out in a wee story that we all know very well. Can you turn to 1 Kings chapter 21? 1 Kings chapter 21. It's our wee friend Ahab, his wife Jezebel, and the next door neighbor called uh, Nebel. Now, Ahab is the king of Samaria. So he lived in the house, the equivalent, I imagine, of Buckingham Palace. So there he was, with all that he owned, all his wealth and power, a lovely big house, and of course he has a next door neighbour who's much, much diminished in status. But the guy next door has something the king doesn't have. Now, Her Majesty the Queen she lives in grandeur and servants and the wealth and but you're funnily mild, diminished world. I've got things the Queen doesn't have, you know. 
I've got a wee dog called Diesel and she doesn't have him. He's my wee dog. I'm my fireside. I'm my chair. I'm my garden. I'm my house. It's mine. I love it. She doesn't have it. Oh, she has maybe something that more grand, but you see, you might have the world in your hands, but someone else might have something and you don't have it and you want it. Neighbors had a wee garden and they had one of it. It was a garden of uh, vines and uh, Ahab looks out and he says, uh, you know, if I could get my hands on it, I, I could rip out all the veins, uh, put in, you know, all sort of herbs and spices, and then the white soup would be a wee bit more spicy and, and uh, tasteful. So he has a simple desire. He just says, I would like to go next door and strike a deal and just try and get my hands in the man's vineyard and turn into a garden of herbs, a simple desire, could anybody be against it? And so he goes next door to strike a deal. Look what it says in verse 2. And they had speak unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard. Now he, he's not standing there saying, I'm the king and I demand it. It's mine, I want it. No. He says, I would like to get it, and here are the terms I'm ready to offer. He says, I will give you substitute land for it that's even better than the land I'll get from you. Or if you'd rather have money in it, I give you more than the worth of it. So he offers him a good deal. But uh, the guy next door, he says, I'd like to pray about it. And so he goes and has a wee time with the Lord and he comes out with the answer and he says, the Lord has forgotten it. I like you as a neighbour. I, I know you're the king and I, I, I respect your business and all that there. I, I understand the terms. I know you're not trying to steal it or rob me blind. I, I, it's a good deal, but it's been my family for generations and I've got to say no. Can people be downright provocative? You ever find that like? Do you remember when we talked about uh, the Apostle Paul uh, being in the ring with Satan, the thorn in the flesh to buffet him? And we talked about those punches that knock you out of the ring and the punches that hurt him and the jabs, the irritation, the frustrations, ah. the provocations. The provocations. Oh, two weeks ago I was provoked by a wee lady you know. She's 95 years of age. And 90 years ago she sat in a wee Sunday school there in the wee hall. And you know her well. She's a cousin of James, Jane Henderson. And she's there in a wee home in Binder, a luxurious wee environment. She has everything taken care of. And sometimes I bring her a few things that she wants and help her out and so on. And, and I got a phone call from her, uh, say two weeks ago. She had to go to the hospital. And the home had phoned me to say, could I take her? And I said, of course I will. It was arranged on the Monday. Uh, the time was two o'clock. I took her at one o'clock, all was arranged. But if you know wee Jean, remember, she's a wee warrior. And she's nothing to do all day because everything's done for except sit and worry. And she worried about the appointment. And she worried, and she worried, and she thought she better phone me and get all clarified and, and make sure we are singing the same hymn sheet, same page, and, and so she phones me. But we Jean is as deaf as that wall. <laughs> and she doesn't put her hearing aid in. And so she phones and says, you, uh, the appointment is at two o'clock, what time are you picking me up by? And I says, Jean, I'll pick you up at one o'clock. She says, you, four o'clock? <laughs> you can't pick me up at four o'clock. The appointment is at two o'clock. You can't pick me up at four o'clock. I, I said, no, Jean, I didn't say four o'clock. I said one o'clock. 
Mutter, she says, oh, you, you have to speak up, I can't hear you. I don't have my hearing aid in. By this time I'm rolling down the phone. I got my finger up. I'm saying, Jean, it's one o'clock. Oh, she was provoking me. She just pressed the button. <laughs> After the phone call came, I had to get a cup of tea. And, and Bridget was sitting beside me laughing her head off. <laughs> but I'm standing there, my finger is magic. She can see me with her own finger up on the phone. You know, we press each other's buttons, we provoke one another. And here's a wee man, and he just says no. I know you're the king, I, I know it's a good deal, but it's my family for all these years. I'm sorry, I can't let you have the land. It's a no deal. So there's a simple desire being denied. But it turns into something evil. Here's how it affected them. This is what we have to be careful about. It says, And Ahab said to them, Nebel, give me thy vineyard. And then it says in verse 3, And Nebel said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word that Nebel, that Jezreelite had spoken unto him, for he said, I will not give the inheritance of my father. And he lay down upon his bed, and he turned away his face, and he would eat no bread. Mm -hmm. You see, this was the man that says, Ah, oh, man, that's a good try. I did the best. Maybe my negotiating skills were. Uh, not like, you know, the fellas in the lion's den. Uh, the best to wear, but I couldn't get the wee bit of land. So that's fine. I turned my attention to something else to hold my life. Oh, no, no. He can, his emotions were stirred. The concupiscence was now being rolled in. The passions had been disturbed. And, and, and he's heavy. He's depressed about it. And he's getting angry about it. He's lost his appetite. He's facing the wall his bed. And he doesn't know how to handle it. Oh, be careful when your simple desires are being denied. And here's a man frustrated and provoked. Now, do you remember the, the, the principle being that it finds an occasion and, and it deceives us? It deceives us. And I think there's deception here because I imagine Ahab deceived himself by believing. That as much as it belongs to the guy next door, I'm entitled to it. I'm the king. Does he not know who I am? And if I'm the king, then I should have whatever I want to have, whatever I decide to have, it should be mine. He's no way to deny it to me. Oh, that's deception. When we think that every desire we have, we are entitled to have it. Mm. I want it. I should get it because I'm so special in this world. I should have it. Oh my goodness, when you take that on to the international stage, mm -hmm. when you get people dressed like the Taliban, the mindset of the Taliban, who would say we may be a wee tiny minority, but we are violent and we have got we have got aggression and we will take the country whether the people want it or not. And we'll put women behind a curtain and keep them in their rooms and rob them of every right to have as a woman. Because of their power, because they're the special thing of God. Desires that become evil in themselves. We're not entitled. And as believers, we should always remember, as believers, we are but sinners, and all that we have comes purely by the grace and the mercy of God. And we rejoice in what we have. But we don't carry the arrogance that says, I desire it, therefore because of who I am, I must have it. And here's a man to seek himself and think that he was entitled to have what he wanted. And what goes on? You see, there's fixation here as well. Uh, you, you can see that. You look at verse 5. But Jezebel's wife, now, if you've got a wife, hopefully you've married a good thing. A good wife. Now, how should a good wife respond to a man like that? She comes in and he's lying on his bed. He says, I don't want to eat anything. He 
She says, what's wrong with you? Right on face. The guy next door. I tried to do a deal with him. Uh, it was a good deal. One that was to his advantage. He just turned me down. And again, she reminds him. Hey, are you not the king? In other words, feed the deception. You are entitled to it. That man's got no right to turn you down. So we're going to have to find some way to get it by foul means or fair. But here was our failure as a wife. You see, we got a wee dog about 15 years ago and diesel. And whenever it's a wee dog, of course, we got tuned into all those TV programs, anything to do with dogs. And Caesar Milan comes along, the dog whisperer that understands the sight of dogs, and we learn to lot. And uh, you take this dog, you save a family that was all out of control, and you'd say, the family's the problem, not the dog. And then the dog would see another dog ready to rip the throat out of the other dog. And so Caesar Milan takes this so called violent dog for a walk and sees another dog ready to, you know. But uh, to read the body language of the dog, to know that we moment when this dog's uh, seen the other dog and ready for a fight, that's the moment when you redirect the attention of the dog. You slip your foot behind the other foot and you give it a wee dig, <laughs> dig in the leg. It just redirects. Oh, what do you want? It's just like you're having a conversation with somebody and, and I want their attention. I go along and give you a tap on the shoulder and I just, uh, what do you want? Oh, just to, to break, to snap the attention the fixation. And if this was a good loyal wife, she'll understand the body language. Here's my husband and he's got things all out of proportion. He's going crazy as uh, button being pressed by the guy next door. He does not meet this. We bought a land he can do without it. He can learn to live without it. So she should snap him out of it. Go oh, dear ways, read the body language of your husband. Vice versa. If you're becoming spiritual and healthy about the fixations in life, and they're contemplating maybe I can't get it by fair means. Maybe I'll get it by underhand means. Maybe I can pull a few strings illegitimately to get it. <clears throat> and here's a man prepared to sacrifice his character and his righteousness for the sake of an evil desire. <clears throat> As believers, we should never sacrifice the glory of God, the honor of God, the integrity of God, the integrity of our faith for evil desires. A gentleman. And here's Ahab provoked. <laughs> the guy next door just simply says uh, no. And maybe the person provokes you, they're just simply exercising their right to say no. I don't want to sell the house. I don't want to sell the car. I, I, I appreciate the offer, but there's no law that says I'm under a moral obligation to uh, do a deal to your advantage, to uh, the disadvantage of my own. Gotta say no, but we can read that you see as provocative. God says no. Look out for sin, finding those occasions in your life, a base of operation your desires. Keep them simple. And if you can't get what you want, keep it as a simple desire. Don't allow it to come evil. By those buttons inside those passions to turn them into something concoction, evil desire that causes hurt and conflict and the destruction of your Christian faith. Now I had an argument for you this morning but I see the clock. I got this body to end and I don't want to keep us behind those masks so we'll just leave it at that and if you want me back at another time I'll come back and we'll take the next wee one that's in the series and we'll finish it there. So for now, just let's have a wee word of prayer. Father, we know that even as believers, we're still very human. We haven't got rid of the old sinful nature. It's still there. It still causes trouble. Father, we pray that those desires that we have in our hearts, the little dreams, the ambitions we have for life, 
that you'll give us the grace that will enable us, our Father, never to allow them to become evil, to keep them simple. And if we can get them by ethical means, then just give us the grace, our Father, to forbear with them, to do without them, to live without them, for your honour and for your glory. These things we ask in our Saviour's precious name. Amen. God bless you. Thank <laughs> you.